Caregivers, have you ever felt like nothing is going right? Well, cheer up and welcome to Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver Radio Program, where you'll learn how to avoid that dreaded thing called caregiver burnout and how to survive the grieving process. Join Dave and his guests now as they share practice tips and tools that you can start using immediately to help get you through this day. Now, here's your caregiver host, Dave Nassani. From Los Angeles, a big LA, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver, coming to you live globally on iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, and just too many others to mention. So we have an exciting show (laughs) planned for you today with my lovely co-host, Adrian Gruberg. She just makes me shine. You know, I'm spit, she's (laughs) polished, and uh, we make a good chemistry team there. And today, say hello, Adrian. by the way. Hi. <laughs> See, she really is there. And today we will be interviewing uh, Del Gerard, author, speaker, coach, and minister of the gospel. He just does it all. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to buy a watch, he could probably sell you a watch. <laughs> <Not> a <million. laughs> no, I'm just kidding about that. So before we get started, I want to thank our wonderful uh, guest, AJ, you remember who it was last week? Me. Oh, that's why. <laughs> yes, thank you, AJ, for coming on the show. And uh, thank you, Dave, for uh, our guest uh, had a cold or something and had to cancel at the last minute. So AJ and I, as we do periodically, just answer everybody's questions. And it was a great show. I think those are some of the best shows that we've ever done because we're just, you know, it's Adrian and Dave unplugged live and yeah. um, we really shine, if I may say so. <laughs> so. Or in this case, she makes me shine, and I just spit on her. I don't know. <laughs> that that oh. didn't come out right, but you know what I mean. I it's know. Hard. Okay. So you can listen to that uh, interview and all our interviews on our membership website, caregiverdave.com, which I made um, uh, Adrian a charter member. Um, I don't know if she took advantage of that yet, Not but yet. I'm sure she will. And I also uh, joined her into our private Facebook page so that she can just clean it up because it's <laughs> <laughs> and she's the expert. <laughs> um, all right, enough of that. Doctor, doctor. Oh, you're not a doctor, are you, Dell? I went through the doctor program. Okay, well, are you serious? Seriously. Doctor Dell Gerard. That sounds so much better, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. you, you, you try to hide stuff. You don't want to tell everybody all that stuff. You know, just... not, at least not all at the once. You want to like yeah. dribble it out in dribs and drabs. Yeah. Well, why don't you just take a minute or two? I'm not going to introduce you. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. So um, just in about a minute or two, who is Del Gerard? And um, number one, why should we care? But more than that, why was he put on this <laughs> earth? <laughs> He's a good friend, so I can say that to him. Oh my God. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare say that to someone I didn't know. But go ahead. I'm already crying. <laughs> we haven't even got started yet. You got me crying. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, depending on who you ask, who is right. Del Gerard. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I'm a father. I got four kids. You know, I have lots and lots of friends, but uh, really who I am. I like to say, and I said this years ago, uh, I'm a warrior for the Lord. And all that simply means is, you know, I fight his cause. So for me, what he told me who I was at age 43, you know, when you're struggling, you're being challenged, uh, he came into that, that time frame and said, this is who you are. And I went, great, what does that mean? <laughs> 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 but really, uh, I'm a simple guy, uh, no nonsense. Uh, I love helping people. My actual purpose that he gave me, again, crying in my car, what is my purpose? And he said, help others make meaningful changes in their life. <clears throat> and I went, oh, I wrote it down, to help others. He said, no, did I say to? I was like, okay, no problem. But really, yeah. uh, <laughs> I like to have fun. I'm a fun-loving guy. I tell people I'm fun, I'm funny, I'm fun to be with. But I don't try to be funny. I don't like when people try to be phony. I don't like uh-huh. when people lie and cheat and steal. Uh, I'm all about people. I build relationships, everything uh, about people. I love 
except for all the negative stuff. If you come in with a negative attitude, you're going to be around me. I'm the wrong guy to be around. I'll tell you, I'm sorry. You got to go. So I'm just a real nice guy, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, so, but I'm a helper. That's part of my gifting. I'm a helper. Yeah, and you have a wonderful voice. You'd be a good um, radio host. Have you thought about radio, Dell? <laughs> I actually have a radio show on ah. Ray International called The Spiritually Minded Man. It's on Fridays, 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And you can go to awoptalk247.com. Can you repeat? A Repeat that. A, a W O P talk two four seven dot com, and the A W O P stands for Amazing uh, Women of Power. You can Ooh. go to amazingwomenofpower.com. dot com, and then of course she started this a long time ago. And then she added the men, so it's Amazing Men and Women of Power. And Dave, as you mentioned, podcast as of last week. We are an official iTunes podcast. All so, right. Good for you. So you go to AWOP, you can search on iTunes, and then uh, she'll have, a, I think there's 16 of us, and then you can just see my show. It's got my lovely picture on there. Oh. You can listen to it, download. So I'm really proud of so, that. So now you said uh, spiritually minded men. So does that mean all the spiritually minded women are out of luck, or how does that work? No. Uh, we started this when we first started. Uh, I'm about family, I'm really about unity ever since I was a kid. And so uh, it's, it's amazing, most of my clients were women. So they said, oh, can you help us with the man? So everybody's like, the spiritually minded man, the spiritually minded man, this is for men, work with men. And as I start working with men, which I used to do, and it's no big deal, but I went, I don't want to work just with men. But what about the kids and everything? So really when I yeah. uh, asked the Lord, the spiritually minded man really is me. I'm spiritually minded. So when I, I talk see. to people, when I coach people, they said, do you know that you naturally bring in scriptures and Bible and references and all this stuff? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I didn't know that's what I was doing. But the Lord had told me, I was a teacher of his word, not that you have to know the Bible, but your, your references, the principles I come from, you know, in life. I didn't know that it, in sixth grade when I learned the golden yeah. rule, it wasn't until like I was 39 that I read in the Bible, there it is, do unto others as you have to do unto you. Nobody told me that was in the Bible. So I learned that a lot of things that I was taught came from the Bible. So now I had a basis to talk to people and go, this is not my truth. This is what thus the Bible says. So that's where I came from. Well, that's cool. And for those of you wondering why my background looks a little funky is because <laughs> I'm not in my studio today. I am at my mother-in-law's house because we had to put her in a nursing home because she has dementia mm. and she's not coming home. So we're going to have to, boy, she's got a lot of stuff. Well, that, wow. that <clears throat> is an accomplishment, isn't it? It is, but uh, it's because her health started failing and her heart, uh, this and that. So she had a legitimate reason to go to the hospital, but they did not want her to come back to her house. Uh -huh. Thank God, only took them two years to tell us that we've been trying to tell them uh you know mentally they won't uh send you back it has to be right. a physical thing and not a mental thing because right. there's always silly mm -hmm. rules to protect them from uh lawsuits <laughs> now from children who are trying to steal their um uh you know their assets and stuff which does happen but it's such a, a minority i don't know if it's one percent i don't know what the number is but I, I don't want to think that it's worse than that, but it could be. Who knows? Yeah. But I see you've got a bicycle hanging back there, so you're also a healthy-minded man and, uh, as a, <laughs> in addition to being a spiritually-minded man. That's why you look so fit. Uh, well, I, I, uh, thank God for clothes, but <laughs> they say clothes make the man, you know? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But I am a former PE teacher, <clears throat> fitness trainer. Ah, I and, knew it. And athletic coach. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but over the years, all the wear and tear on my body. <laughs> uh, so I've actually postponed for years now, but I've decided um, I didn't want to do it through the holidays. So on February 10th, I go back to talk <clears throat> about double knee replacement. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I had a knee replacement last year. 
Just one at this time. Don't go walking one. on the ice after you're recovering because that could be really bad. <laughs> no. A double knee replacement. <clears throat> they're not partials. Uh, well, they're not gonna, not partials. Uh, they're not going to do it all at once, but it's going to be full knee. And you're talking about somebody who was a high caliber athlete. I mean, mm -hmm. we grew up poor, you know, mm -hmm. early in the '60s, and we didn't have a lot, so we were outside every day. We played football, basketball, uh -huh. all that stuff, but on concrete. We didn't have grass. I mean, we had grass, but we didn't play on regular grass. You know? right. We were in the streets. We're, we were on the streets, river. too. <laughs> Real men play on concrete, yes. We play on concrete, and it was tackle, and we learned. And so that's, that's how we got to that point. And, uh, in fact, I oh. thought I was going to be a pro athlete until oh. my coach at 20 years old got on me. Well, it's a good thing you and, didn't, or you'd also be suffering from traumatic brain injury since every <laughs> – a uh, pro football player does. Depending on more. what he practiced. <clears throat> yeah. It doesn't matter. The brain is not designed to be Dr. jogged football. around. Uh -uh. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, you'll be happy to know we're broadcasting this live on Facebook, and I forwarded it to your page, your Facebook page. Ooh. So oh, awesome. All of your people. <laughs> and, um, I should also do it to Adrian's, but Adrian, you kind of use your page. Do it to Craig's, too. Answer. Put it on Craig's. Uh, well, then you you two will have to talk amongst yourself because I can't <laughs> chew gum and uh, and talk at the same time. So my first thing is tell us about, uh, without going into too much detail, because a lot of these people who who listen, you know, aren't uh, uh, Christians. Some of them are Jews. Some of them are atheists. Some of them are Buddhists. Some of them, are, God knows what they are, you know. Some New of them age. are Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, ouch. <laughs> so just, I didn't uh, say it. Just, I just did. Tell us, tell us how you came about this faith, just so that we can know where you're coming from. And uh, because you've got a lot of good things to say after that, but uh, just briefly, and then I'll, I'll send this over to Craig's page while you do that. <laughs> well, my faith, I grew up Catholic, <clears throat> like everybody else, you know, I grew uh -huh. up Catholic. Uh, and that's Me too, me too, by the way. And, yeah, so it, it was crazy. You make your confirmation, eighth grade, <clears throat> excuse me. But I always had questions that, uh -huh. quite frankly, I didn't get answered. So there was always just one thing in my mind, and I've always had a love for mm -hmm. God, but I didn't know who Jesus was. So it was always just a love for God. But then when I became a freshman in high school, there was a Young Life organization that I was introduced to, and it was different. Mm. And I liked it, but I didn't know how different it was. But I was there to taste the girls and all the other stuff. And so my sophomore <laughs> year, I'm 15 years old, and I know the ropes, you know, I'm chasing the girls. And this, <clears throat> our one leader came and sat, or literally, I'm sitting here, the girls sitting here, and he sat right between us. And I went up, and I got so mad, I went up near the, the sound system and just sat. I was just squirming. <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> but the guy had a message. I didn't know what he was talking about. And next thing I knew, I was like, <clears throat> Hey, have you heard about Jesus? And for the next four and a half months, that's all I was doing. But I really didn't know anything. I just mm. felt this thing. Mm. But it wasn't until better I felt than telt, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that you know, when I got divorced, <clears throat> uh, it's thirty-eight. You know, six months after that, that's when wow. the Lord really got a hold of me. And uh, it's interesting when you get to a place where you go, mm. it was her fault. But he asked me a simple question, you know, okay, whose fault was it? And I said, hers. He said, but who was responsible? And when that question hit, it just floored me. I could just tell that this was not what I thought it was. And that started my journey mm -hmm. about who is God, who Jesus really was, start praying. And, and then uh, five years later, at age 43, he said, this is who you are. The question came, actually, the question came, he said, can I deny uh, who I am, and of course, it was like, stupid question, God, you know. This <laughs> <laughs> so I've got truth. This is actually what happened. And then uh, he said, neither can you deny who I say you are. And I was like, oh, my God. <clears throat> so the first question I was like, well, who am I? And he said, you're a teacher of my word. And I was like, I don't know the word. He said, you don't have to, <clears throat> just have to follow my instructions. Wow. And that started me on the journey of just listening and, and listening right. to God and, and then doing things. So since our audience is caregivers, tell us about uh, how you became involved in caregiving and, uh, you know, what you learned and, and what you can uh, share with other caregivers 
so that they don't have to make the same mistakes that you made. <laughs> I assume you made some mistakes because I made some mistakes. Adrian, well, did you make any mistakes? No. Oh, Adrian. Didn't. <laughs> <clears throat> It's great to know some of us are perfect and we don't have to worry about <laughs> Oh, I didn't say I was perfect. <laughs> but I did, I did don't know, I did pretty first, well. So. Yeah. yeah, my, um, you know, when you're younger, <clears throat> you don't have much. Uh, you're constantly being babysat by others, you know, the older folks and stuff like that, the grandmas, mm. the grandpa. We grew up with that, you know, in one home. And so when they got ill you know we always had to cut hey baby can you come do that can you give mama's medicine can you get grandma's this so that you know i've always had that i want to help people that was in there but it was that spirit of taking care of people and so my both my sisters and uh, they're younger than me but they were both caregivers for a while and my youngest right. sister she worked you're lucky you had to help <laughs> yeah well, well, there were six of us, so. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but I was the, the the second, but our oldest child, uh, my oldest brother, he lived in Louisiana, so basically I raised the other kids <clears throat> from six years old on. So <clears throat> babysitting, <clears throat> taking care of cooking, cleaning all that stuff, I learned on my own. So by the time, you know, they say you get teenager, please. I've been doing that stuff for years. By the time I was 18, I was taking care of everybody's kids. They bring to me, come here. <clears throat> you know, you discipline, you do everything. But what was crazy is, <clears throat> I've always wanted to do it, but I really didn't know much about it. But my sister did, my younger sister. She worked in the hospital as, I think, a nurse's assistant, not a nurse's aide. I'm, I'm not sure which one it is, but the, they're the ones who, when uh, codes are happening, or whatever, was it code blue, and the people are dying, they come in. Oh. She is so good at this stuff. She's the type of person when she bags them when they're dead, don't run, she'll come in eating a sandwich, she'll be playing music, oh. watching TV. She, she it's, it's like normal stuff for her. And then wow. she spent another five years um, for the doctors when they write their medicines and everything and they got that bad handwriting. She's the <laughs> one who would say, I'm serious. She was the one that say, no, this is what the doctor meant, blah, blah, blah. And it was great because when our dad passed away, they're not supposed to, uh, you don't know who she is, so I can say this. Normally you don't let the family member be on the same floor that you're working on. Well, they loved her so much, they put her with him on the same floor. And so she got to regulate everything. Wow. So it, it was great, but I've always had that heart for that. So when I was going through my stuff down and out in 2008, when coaching went to the tank, <laughs> I started doing a daycare, or not daycare, caregiver. You mean because nobody could afford coaching in 2008? They, they couldn't get afford it. I mean, it was great yeah. until, you know. They couldn't. You know, I, they couldn't afford lattes either. I know what the food. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> it was, you know, you're tanked. And so uh, <laughs> we all had to go in there. And I only did it for about a year. And it was hard, mm. I'll tell you. It wasn't hard because of the work was hard. <clears throat> but it was hard because for me, I felt everything. <clears throat> so whatever a person was going through, I felt that. Empathy. You know, oh, yeah. Some, some, people, some people have that ability to remove themselves. And, yeah. you know, still successfully yeah. deal with the problem. But I was somebody who took other people's stuff on, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, I could do it. You know, coaching, we could do it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're not worried. But when you're talking about somebody's life and you know they're going to die, you're there to help them. But they're going to die. And they know they're going to die. That was hard. And this is the time where I go, I wish I was God. It was like, you know, healed, healed, mm -hmm. healed. Um, <laughs> it, I'm serious. It, and it was challenging. It was challenging. Uh, yeah. I had fun. I, I learned that if you're uh. like my sister, if you don't have a 100% love for this, and I don't mean this is a job. You can't look at this like a job, you know, that you're going to get paid a lot of money on stuff. You have a, have, have a heart for people. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, my sister, she's one of those that when, you know, people are dying or losing all their body fluids and everything else, and she gets right in there on top of them. I mean, she don't care. Feces around her everywhere. You throw it up in her mouth. and She don't care. She loves it. She thinks that's a blessing from God. Uh, uh, Me, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Uh, I don't mind you doing that over here, but not on the face, you know. And so it was really challenging after a while to go so, through it. And so you really got to have some of that compassion that, uh, oh, I don't know, let's say Bill Clinton has where it's, I'll feel your pain, you know. Oh. And on, with, with that bad joke, we're going to take a break. <laughs>
I, mm. I couldn't help myself. I am so sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Bill. So we'll be right back. <laughs> Don't go away. Welcome, caregivers. Thank you so much for finding your way to our community of loving and supportive caregivers. We as caregivers understand and know the day-to-day -day feelings of guilt, fear, and loneliness. But guess what? There is hope. I, Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver, along with my team of experts and caring caregivers, have made this site just for you. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. We know funds are tight, so we offer all of our individual Thrive Solutions packs. Or for even a better deal, you can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we're here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. And we're back with Del Gerard and Adrian Gruberg and... I wanted to ask you, how did you get involved in coaching, Dell, and, and all the other things that go along with coaching? And when you're finished answering that, I want to ask you, what coaching advice do you have for caregivers? Well, as I started to mention earlier when I was 20, I got a <clears throat> little altercation of a, with a coach. I didn't know at the time he was the head coach. My first day uh, coming on there, and this guy just starts ranting and raving. And he's looking at me, and I, of course, said something back. And uh, the guy next to me goes, bad move. <laughs> I go, what's his problem? He goes, he's the head coach. And that was like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> so that started the next two, three weeks of just <clears throat> hell for me. Uh, you know, you go to practice, and you're missing a, a pad, you know, a hip pad. Next day, you missed a knee pad. And it just was all sorts of stuff. So I got so upset uh, with <clears throat> this coach that I told him uh, that he sucked as a coach and said a couple other things, but basically told him he sucked. <laughs> and he told me if I thought I could coach, but I don't take my black, blah, 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 mm -hmm. coach. And two weeks later, I was coaching PE teacher at elementary school, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Wow. And I, I hated teachers. Oh. I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a coach. I was going to be a professional athlete, football, basketball, whatever. Mm. But the amazing thing was I fell in love with it. It just, okay. uh, it just was crazy. You got these little kids and your athletic ability is so much you know, bigger than theirs. Mm. And so their, their football field is 60 yards. So you got end zone to end zone. Well, you're talking to the mm. pass mm. kick championship guy. So I could throw 60 yards, no problem. You know? So when you throw from end zone to end zone, you're a god to them. And so these kids, and you know, they're all around, they're hanging around, and can you dunk a ball? And, and so that made it really easy to teach them and coach them. And then the YMCA got a hold of me, and they said, hey, would you like to teach these after-school programs? We'll pay you. And I was like, sure. And back then, you know, you're making $3.50 an hour, and someone's going to pay you $15 uh, for 45 minutes. You go, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were the proverbial big fish in the little pond. I really was. And, and Forty eight year olds, you start there and then you move on up. I went from elementary school to junior high, and then, uh, I went from junior high to high school, and and it really was a great experience. Got to win a couple championships as a varsity head coach, you know, track and field, back to back championships. So that started all the other things. And you're always giving advice. Coaches are always giving you instructions. 
whether you want it or not, right? Whether you want it or not, you're always going to have it. So, so you know, how's teaching, how's life coaching different from sports coaching? On one side, it's mm. not when you talk about the principles of what you're doing. Everybody, when they come on the team, uh, sports team, they want to play. They're looking to get better. Well, people in life, they're not just sitting there expecting their life to be the same. They want more in life. They want more out of life. They want to get better. But a lot of times they don't know what to do. They have so many things running in their mind. They don't know exactly what they want. And even if they knew what they want, I would say 90% of them don't know why they want it. It's just they heard something, or, but they're, they're, they're struggling. They're trying all these different things to discover who they are and what they can do. And so coaching, life coaching, basically takes your whole life and looks at that and says, okay, in all this area of your life, what's important to you? And so it made sense to me when God said, help others make meaningful changes. Those meaningful changes are important to them. So life coaching is not about me or anybody that's coaching. It's not about us. We are helpers. We help others. So I tell people, we're going to help you move yourself from wherever you are to wherever you'd like to be in your life. And those are things that are important to you. So I would, you know, come out and people say, well, what do you want? What's your goals? What's your time? I go, I don't come that way. Because people don't know what a goal is. And even if they, people say goals all the time, they fail. <laughs> they don't know why. <laughs> the first they, of every year. Yeah, first of every year. <laughs> so, you know, all you made was a declaration. You didn't put no thought into it. You just said, I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So you just announced that I want it. But you don't know that in order to get to that championship of losing weight, you got to be in practice every single mm -hmm. day repetition you got to learn some skills you got to do drills you got to learn to think different you're talking about your mindset your mentality you know mm -hmm. all that stuff see they go back and forth so the transition to what people call life coaching i'm like are you kidding me you know start with the end in mind okay so what is it you want all right so how are you gonna get it <laughs> they have no clue engineering yeah yeah and, and, and even in the reverse engineering we go we're gonna do this i go what if it doesn't happen that way now what <laughs> hey plan a doesn't work. A little revise. Throw that out. Start over. So we teach them these, I call it skills. In the radio show, I say principles. Life and spiritual principles. Those are the things that help build people's faith, or we would say confidence. Because that's what's going to change your life. Your mindset. What you believe. People say, well, that's what you think. That's true. But what you think comes from what you believe. And as long as you believe it, no one will do anything above or beyond what they believe. So we have to change your belief. But when we're talking about beliefs, we're just talking about mindset. But when we're talking about mindset, we're talking about your decisions. That's all. Just decisions that you made. But where do those come from? The belief, something happened in your life. Somebody told you something. You listened to something. And when you're a kid, you're scared because you heard this knock over there. And that was one of those. I was scared when I was a kid. But then I how grew does, up. How does character come into play? I've heard it said that character is who you are. When no one's looking. When no one's looking. And I forget yeah. what they what they call you uh, when people are looking. Um. <laughs> I don't remember what you but but character <clears throat> really is that. You know, um, I learned this as a kid because you know you would. <clears throat> I tell people if you put a hundred dollars in front of you and you're talking to people, you can walk all the way over here. There's people there. No one's going to touch it because they know you're watching. They know you can see them. They know they're going to get caught. But the minute you get out of there and there's nobody around. Your character says, I want that. I'm going to take that. <laughs> I don't care because no mm. one's looking. That's your character. Or your character can say, you know what? That's not mine. I'm not going to touch that. See, it works both sides. Mm. So one of the things I help people do is discover who you are. If you want to be successful in life, you have to understand you have to be who you are. That's and is character thing. important for success? Character I mean, is extremely there's a lot of course. there's a lot of successful people out there who have no character, you know, and when they get caught, you know, the world is, ex hey, is come exposed on. to them. Hey, you can hide for a little while, but you can't hide. <laughs> you can't hide. That's right. The you real you is going to show up. <laughs> you can run, but you can't but hide. You can't hide it. The real you is going to show up in a way that after a while, you can't keep hiding and lying about all this stuff because everything mm. that you're trying to do, you have to remember. And we're not good enough to remember all these little things that we're doing that we have to hide. Oh, I remember I told this so and so that lie about this. You're not that good. Okay. So, so Adrian, uh, do you consider yourself a coach, a life coach, or any kind of coach?
Are, are you muted, Adrian? I can't hear you. He's shaking her head, probably. <clears throat> Every Am now I and muted? Then, yeah, you were. Every oh, now I'm and sorry. Then, you probably hit your little button. That's why you were so quiet. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I was asking. I wanted to know if, if Dell had any <sighs> professional coach training or if this is just a natural... It's both, and yes, I do both. have. I, I do have it. Uh, I balked at it for years because I said, oh. "So let me get this straight." My, here's my mindset: was okay. I'm a coach. I've been coaching for years. I'm not a coach of people. Yes, I have two master's degree, one in uh, you know uh, spiritual psychology, biblical counseling, and then I went through the doctor program. But I'm like, so I gotta pay somebody, <laughs> yeah, for them to tell me that I am what I think I am. <laughs> right. Like, that exactly. makes no sense. God's already told me who I am. I don't need to pay nobody to tell me who I am. But because the world wants to know, uh, do, do you have the credentials? Right. Okay. Exactly. So you I mean, need I the Wizard of Oz. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's... in 2009, I officially went and got some credentials. Uh, but afterwards, you don't care. I found that if people really, credentials or not, mm. if you find somebody that can help you, you don't care about credentials. You know, that's You'll funny, uh, Adrian. Uh, we both have, um, Dell and I have the same um, mentor, you know, in business and marketing, ah. et cetera. And so I spoke on uh, his stage uh, recently, uh, first time in five years because uh -huh. I've been doing all this stuff. And so he's inter he's introducing me and he says, yeah, and he's been on TV, he's been on Harvard, he's been on this and that, and and and, and I'm coaching him. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, oh, wow, I never thought about that. <laughs> he said, he can be coaching me. <laughs> it's true. I mean, if everybody's born with talent and gifts and abilities. And that's why I say you help people discover who they are. Those seeds that God planted mm -hmm. in, that's the potential for your life. And the sooner that you can you know, mm -hmm. learn what those talents and gifts are and you're bent towards that. Like my sister, she's a caregiver from day one. Mm -hmm. She loves caregiving. She loves cleaning. She loves taking care of people. That's what she does. Me, I had to discover who I was. I thought I was going to be a professional athlete, but really, God told me, "No, you're you're a teacher. You're a teacher of the, the word." So, so, what are the what are the caregiver issues that? Um, I mean, you were a caregiver. I'm sure you went through burnout and the frustration and and you know the the no boundaries and they're violating your boundaries and. And uh, your health is suffering. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not getting enough. Uh, you're not eating right. You're not uh, you're isolating <laughs> yourself. I mean, I can go on and on. You know, right. you're, you're you're just you're just at the bottom of the totem pole. As instead of being selfish, this is my my latest topic now. Caregivers <laughs> need to be selfish in order to survive. And uh, three years ago, or four, I forget how many years ago, I was. I was contemplating the title of my book, and I, I liked The Selfish Caregiver. And everybody says, no, 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 you can't do that. Selfish is not a good word, and, you know, you're going to turn off half the population and this and that, so I didn't go with it. But now all of a sudden at, at TEDx, they liked that, you know, because <laughs> nobody has ever said nobody that. Nobody said that. <laughs> you know, well, there's an interesting, you know, it's a hook. Selfish? I have to be selfish? I'm a caregiver. I'm a caregiver. I have to be selfish? You know, and being selfish can actually save your life because the pendulum is so far away, as far as you can get from being selfish. You know, it's selfless. Selfish. Selfless, yes. And that, you know, you got to be selfish, really selfish, to bring it back to at least where it's balanced. Yeah. And then you can stop being selfish or at least not being so selfish. But it, it's a great uh, uh, paradigm shift. For for me to say, I mean, it was very easy for me to be selfish because maybe I'm a selfish person. I don't know. I don't think so. But, <laughs> but what does the jury say? <laughs> some people have a much easier time implementing boundaries and um, I wouldn't say encouraging confrontation, but not shying away from confrontation. Right. I don't shy away from confrontation because I figure if it's right, if if you know, you do what's right, and if it means World War III, well, let the chips fall where they may, because this is worth fighting for. I choose my battles very carefully. I don't like to fight with my wife, but every now and then, I've got to declare war <laughs> because it's an important topic. And there are many, many, many people out there 
who were like the ones when Hitler was uh, just going all over Europe, you know, first Poland and then, uh, you know, Yugoslavia and all the Baltic, just one after the other. And everyone in Western Europe were saying, oh, just give them one more, maybe, you know, just appease and just anything because we don't want war. We, you know, we want peace. And maybe if he gets enough, he'll... And you know what? There's no such thing enough. is enough. <laughs> Every, you know, if they would have uh, stopped Hitler right after he invaded Poland, then maybe there would be six million more Jews on this planet than there are. <laughs> well, I wanted to say one thing about <clears throat> the selfishness. Um, even if you <clears throat> sit and think, okay, what would I do if I was a selfish person? <laughs> you know, if I was selfish, what would I do? Make it theoretical it, and hypothetical. It, yeah, if it's theoretical, <laughs> you, you can sometimes find that it balance. Fantasize, yeah. You know, it's it's um, sometimes it helps 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 you clarify your thinking. So pretend you're one of those um, caregivers. Give me one of your hypotheticals and your theoreticals. Just to get the ball rolling in some people's minds. I mean, for me? <laughs> or, either either one of you. But go ahead, go ahead go Dale. No, no, it, it is go ahead. Ladies, ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, say, the time came where I needed, um, I, I needed a week to myself. Wow, that's so I, selfish, Adrian. That was very so. So how yeah. would I do that? Well, um, maybe you can so compromise and say, no, a week's too much, I'll take three days. I'll take three, so you, you can compromise, okay, so how am I going to do this? <clears throat> well, I could hire somebody, you know, and mm -hmm. then you figure out how to make it happen. Um, Great idea. And and there's that <clears throat> that balance, um, well, because the, the, the person that you're caring for has to deal with it, too. They may not like it. Oh, they won't like but it. <laughs> that's part of the that's part of the boundary setting. Yeah. You know, every now and then I'm going to need some time to myself. <laughs> yeah, it's like on Shark Tank. You know how one of the sharks is negotiating, and yes. another shark who's already out is throwing in his two cents. And Mr. Wonderful will always go, "Hey, I don't hear you making an offer. Quick, right. criticize mine." <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. So, how about you, Dell? Well. I'm one of those that. How's Dell going to be selfish? Uh, <laughs> theoretically, it, of course. Theoretically, yeah. and, and it's for me, honestly, it is hard. Even in my personal life today, it yeah. is hard to be selfish because your mindset, again, your character, is really not about you. Your your whole thing is to help other people, but there are times that you have to go. I need a break, and then. Even when you say that, someone's going to squat, and they're going to come up going to say something why you can't take a break or why they need something and why you should do this. It's an obligation. Mm -hmm. But we're talking Shuts. about your, your temperament and your personality. You are not a shy person, and you are not I, someone who will keep your feelings inside of you, I and actually, you're not someone I, who shies away from confrontation, I well, would okay. assume. So, okay, so <laughs> let me back up to give you the, a, a little truth background here. Okay. Number one, I am a very shy person. I grew up quiet and shy. I was small. I got beat up all the time. And <laughs> I, in high school, I grew 13 inches and over Whoa. 80 pounds. I was 5'2". Wow. And <laughs> people, a lot of know this. There's people out there that know that I went to school that I was tiny. <laughs> so wow. I was 112 pounds. But by senior, that was a blessing from God, huh? 195 pounds, and I got an attitude because <laughs> I used to get beat up. So I don't shy away from confrontation, <laughs> but I don't um, Go looking come for out it. with the, the anger and, you know, first time, ah, I'll start off real like, okay, I'm not going to back up yet, but I want to find out some things. So yeah, I'll but you're scary with, looking and intimidating. You know, I don't think so. Say that, that's just the beard. You have the same beard. <laughs> and I tell people, even the pastor well, that's, said that. I said, that's because he's now, smiling. Now, with that smile, he, he, he he does does scary. he doesn't always you smile. Oh, i got to okay. tell him every now and then, smile, Dad. You, you scare people. When I do get upset, I have this look about me 
Yeah, let's see the look. Do the look. No, I, I, I can't show the look. Okay. <laughs> but the look is it really it, it's kind of like one of those like. <clears throat> that's a yeah, good that's look. Good. And, and that's Child, just a start. Children, don't look at the screen. No. But I tell them I'm fine. I'll, I'll get into the talking because you know you you get to doing that. If I start cursing, which is very very rare, but if <laughs> you ever hear me curse, I'm ready to hit somebody. But I don't go there because. I know me, and I know that's not the way to go. But for me, when I do confront the people, like I had one guy uh, I was taking care of, and he's probably passed now, but this, you know, he was an Air Force uh, fighter pilot, and he was decorated. And he was like 88 years old, and he's got a tracheotomy, and, you know, he's talking like this, but he is, he was a leader. So here's one of these guys that his whole family said, we can't keep anybody with this guy because he would just rah, 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 and people just got to the so they wanted somebody big and so i yeah. come over there i'm serious i'm like why is it you know i've always used my size i'm one of those people but i gotta you know come in like i'm the big tough guy so i come in he's lying in the bed and i don't know that my boss and her boss is there with the daughter <clears throat> so i just come in and i'm just being myself hi how you doing and he's not saying much <laughs> and then all of a sudden he starts you know, rock, 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 just complaining. He's doing the 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 bits. He's just, about everything. He's and, sizing you up. Yes, he and he's like, and and you're not gonna come in here, blah 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 blah. And I said, listen, you need to shut up right now. I said, you're not <laughs> crazy. This is what you're going to be doing. I'm here to help you. And then I started with that, boom, boom, boom. And I said, you got that? And he looked at me and goes, you got that? And he goes, yes. And I'll be right back. And I turn around. And there's my boss is something like this. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I'm in trouble. But the daughter, I didn't know that was his daughter, took him aside and said, I want this guy. <laughs> and so, oh, see? I came in, and uh, he was just brilliant. This guy was brilliant. He just needed somebody to talk to. But as you start talking, he goes, I'm tired of these whips. You know, because he's a, a leader of a you know military squadron. So... This guy's right. not taking no bull. He respects others that don't take no bull. Were you a Marine? Were you in the Marines? Nope. Any service? Nope. Wow. Thank God I passed it. I wanted to go, but, you know, Vietnam War was on when I was. Yeah. Nixon pardoned you. Yeah. So. Pardoned us both. You would have made a good drill sergeant. Uh, how tall are you? 6'3". That's, that's big. Listen, we're going to take another break, so uh, I don't have a bad joke this time, so don't go away. <laughs> we will be right back. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too. Reclaim your caregiver sanity by learning when to say yes and when to say no. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through, because he is one. And he now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his incredible caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first, before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child, and caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Reclaim your caregiver sanity by learning when to say yes and when to say no. We'll help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life, and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today, or buy one for your special caregiver. On sale everywhere, and at caregiverscaregiver.com. And we're back with Del Gerard and Adrian Gruberg and just talking about how mean Dell is <laughs> <laughs> when he wants to be. I mean, no, he doesn't have a mean in his body. You know, Dell, I'm a very shy person also. A lot so of people don't I. realize that. Uh, I'm an introvert. I even did a five minute of Dave's hammock wisdom on that, saying, how did I become uh, to appear to be so um, aggressive or extroverted? It's because I had a cousin who was very extrovert, and I just observed him. And I saw, you know, I couldn't get any girls because I was too shy to ask. I wouldn't pick up the phone. <laughs> this guy was getting girls, like, left and right. So I just observed him. I saw what he did, how he spoke to them, how he carried himself. And, and I slowly became him. Now, not really. I just 
act like him. So like I'm an actor. Mm -hmm. But deep down inside, I go into a room of crowded people. The first thing I want to do is just find a, a quiet little corner and just, you know, eat my food by myself and just look at everybody. <laughs> And I got to force myself to go out because, and every time I do, it's rewarding because I'll meet great people who, you know, have become lifelong friends. And if I just followed my inclination, just stayed to myself, you know, I'd be a hermit. Well, it's interesting that you said that because I had to learn that as well. I used to wonder why people, why some people got the girls and others didn't. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious because. You know, I was just too quiet even uh, through college. I was quiet, but then you, you break out of that. But one of the things I've learned is there's other people, even the ones that are totally <clears throat> not shy and are coming up and talking to people, they're scared. They're scared. They're just coming yeah. up and they're talking trash. They're, they're saying whatever, but they're scared. Even Why the bullies are. are scared. Even, even the bullies are scared. It, it is absolutely Especially scary. the bullies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're scared. And and you know what, what, how you fix a bully? You become a bully to them, and then they, all of a sudden they respect you and they leave you alone, you know? They leave they, you alone. They, they tuck their take, tail between their yeah, legs. It usually <laughs> takes a punch in the nose, and then, uh, you know, that happens in prison all the time. It happens in junior but it, it's, it's one of those, uh, and, <clears throat> and I've learned this again about now, I, I'm still shy when it comes to, I'll say this publicly, mm. women, you know, I don't go, hey, baby, you know, I did it. <laughs> yeah, when you get older, you, that stuff, leave that, that stuff alone. That's, if you want to go talk <laughs> to somebody, go up and say hello, talk to somebody. That's how I do it. Mm. Now, but see, I understand. This is part of my gifting, my voice, uh, my manner. You smile to people, that old thing, you treat people like you want to be treated. That is all true. So I approach people differently now, mm. just from a simple Hey, how you doing? Conversation. You know, that old three foot rule. Anybody's within three feet, say hello. Make eye contact. Smile. But don't come in weak and, uh, you know, kind of wishy washy like Charlie Brown. One thing I learned with women women love confidence. So if you're going to say hello, say hello with confidence. Don't yeah. come in there and uh, look like you're scared. So I come in with confidence. Now, inside might be going, you know, 90 miles an hour, but outside I'm just as cool, just looking. But but you come in with confidence, you come in with certainty, you come in with, hey, I'm just trying to say hello, be uh, personable, as we say, and then go from there. I like making friends, and then once I make the friends, if there's anything else, you can go from there. But I'm not concerned about all the other stuff that you know we were thinking about when we were younger. I don't think about any of those things anymore. No, that's one of the blessings. <laughs> When you get older, you realize that. So all you young people listening, ain't nobody concerned about that stuff that you're concerned about. We ain't thinking, we got no time for that stuff. We got other stuff that we're trying to take care of in our lives. Yep. Be, so, I'm just being myself. <laughs> don't don't worry about the other people. That's right. You know? And if so, somebody doesn't want to, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. So what was the biggest thing that, that caused you and or your sister to burn out uh, while you were caring for your loved one? Well, my, my sister, uh, my one sister burnt out. My other sister did not, but for, for me personally. Well, was um, she alone when she was burning out? She was getting no help, or what was the problem? <clears throat> she would get help, but it's always, it's not the kind of help that you want or you well, expect to get. She was a perfectionist. The help wasn't good enough. Nobody yeah. could do it as good as her, yeah. right? So it's a little okay. different. Yeah. So she was, My other sister, she was, yeah. She, she, they, the they're organized. Was lower. Yeah. yeah. She, she don't mm. care. Nobody else can help. I can do it. Somebody else can help. We can do it. But if you really want to do it right, let's do it all together. That's her. So what were some of the challenges, and how did you overcome them? So for me, my biggest challenge was it was hard for me to see people die. It was hard for me to see people die. Because you're with them, you build a relationship, you're used to seeing them, and all of a sudden, they're gone. And that was tough for me. Like I said, my oh. sister can deal with that. Yeah. I can't. Uh, it, it's just hard because my heart, I just don't want a superficial relationship. I right. want a personal, intimate relationship with everybody that I really am in contact with. So yeah. if I say, I'm going to call you tomorrow, I'm calling you tomorrow. That's not just talk. If I say, I want to go out and do something with you, I want to go out and do something with you. So I got really attached to people, and I know that's one of the things they tell you, you can't do. You can't be attached. 
just have to do your job. And I didn't like that at all. So I I cross lines like crossword puzzles, you know, <laughs> crossing lines all the time, having conversations that they say you're not supposed to have conversations with. And these people loved it. One of the things they hated was people didn't really talk to them. They kind of like superficially talked to them, but nobody right. really related to them. And They're so I got in there. Cool. Yeah, and I came in and I was like, yeah. And well, I got into trouble all the time, got my hands spanked, and, and I got tired of it. I just got tired of it. And I said, you know, we, if it was me in that same situation, I would want somebody to treat me with the dignity that I would mm. want to be treated with. Me Not too. because it's your job and you're only getting paid $10 an hour anyway, and so you're going to give just the bare minimum. That's not me. I want to come in and if I love you, I love you with everything. I don't love you with just a little bit as it suits me. Mm -hmm. So I got, I didn't like the, not mm -hmm. politicking, but the, the rules and regulation that's coming down. You know, here's what you can do. You can't, don't talk about God either. Mm -hmm. Unless they bring something up. Don't talk about no God. Don't talk about all this other stuff. That's not your job. You're not there for that. Throw all that out the window. I'm in. Whatever you want to talk about, let's go. Whatever you want to do, let's go. I'm helping yeah. you. Whenever I talk to audiences, I tell them, hey, I'm not, if you're not a caregiver, don't tune out right now because I got news for you. Just wait. You're either going to become a caregiver or you're going to need a caregiver. There's no escaping it. Now is the time to learn and prepare how to be a caregiver because it happened overnight like it did with me. It's not on your resume. You're never ready. And, and that's kind of my message to them that uh, whatever I am telling you for caregivers to do, I mean, they should have taught us this stuff in junior high during home <laughs> economics. How to make a grilled cheese sandwich, how to be a caregiver. <laughs> right? It just makes sense. I learned how to make a nice candy oh. start. <laughs> yeah, now when are you going to use that? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, oh. Got a question? So, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was just going, I'm wrapping it up. We're almost out of time, and I'm just saying. Uh, that went fast. It, when when See, you're having fun, it goes fast. Nothing to be scared of. <laughs> That's for sure. Once you get involved, you know, it's nothing to be scared of. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I didn't say this on the on the air before. He said, you know, I'm getting a little nervous, and I don't know I'm really getting nervous. <laughs> uh, and I told him the famous words of one of the twins from uh from Double Trouble, uh, when she told Elvis that, uh, Elvis, I'm just so scared. He says, honey, it's normal to get them butterflies. It just means you're alive. And, <laughs> and every time I get a little nervous before I go on stage, I just remember the sideburns and, and what Elvis said. And as far as I'm concerned, he was telling me that. And I says, you know, it's okay. If Elvis gets butterflies, I can do that as well. So It's, it's like the book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Yes. And Tony yeah. Robbins, what did he say? If you fear, you must. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know for me that the, the butterfly that we get, you know, because the athletes, you get them. That means you're ready. That's what we yes. tell them. When you get in that little anxiousness, I said, that means oh. you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're going to The fine. pump is prime. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the last three minutes, Dell, what would you like to share with uh, our caregivers that maybe you haven't had an opportunity to do yet? <clears throat> Well, you know, it's interesting as a caregiver. I mean, notice a giver it's of a care. care yes. uh, that's right. You're giving care. And one of the things I learned, if you're not 100% all in, mm -hmm. nobody's forcing you. Nobody's telling you got to do it. You're not concerned about money. And you're not motivated by and, guilt. No, none mm -hmm. of that stuff. Your heart is for them. I'm talking about the love. That's where you get... Uh, the agape love, as people were talking about. Mm -hmm. If you're not 100% there, I would suggest as a coach, you know, you know, we kind of throw it out there, not telling you what to do, but possibly think of something else you might want to do. Because th this is a, a place where your compassion and everything else about humanity that yeah. we would want has to be there. It has yeah. to be there. Especially if it's killing you. And you're upsetting them. Yeah. And people can feel it. You know, like we say, you know, sales is a transference of feelings. People, you can look at somebody and tell they're not happy. Come on. But when you look into somebody's eyes and you can genuinely see that oh. they are concerned about you, it makes the total difference in the world. The total difference. And I'll tell you this one little quick story. I had to, I had to take care of a guy who had cancer in the jaw. 
Uh, these teachers are younger than me, and so we had to drive him every day to USC. And then, of course, uh, we had to keep his weight up, but he would eat and throw up, eat and throw up. So they brought me over there because, again, big, strong guy. I can cook, and now I got to tell this guy. And he's, he's like, you know, he's a professor at the college, so I got to tell this guy, your butt needs to eat. You're going to eat this, and that's it. You understand? <laughs> so we'd be forced. I mean, it was literally like that. And for three months, I did that. And they were so thankful. The doctor, they said, we don't know how you did it because of the, the chemo would make him throw up. He would yes. feel sick. But he maintained his weight the entire time. That's fabulous. And then I began to gain like two pounds. I go, that's it? And they're like, you have no <laughs> idea. That is awesome that he didn't lose weight and he gained at the end two pounds. I thought, wow. but it, it really is like that. It really is like that. So that, that's my advice that... You know, come in with your heart, love on the people, and just be there in their, their times of possibly of transition. That's a special time. It's a gifted time that God's given you with people. And, and just what's be your there. contact information? If somebody wants to uh, have you coach for them, uh, how can they get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me. I'll give you two emails. One is simple. Coach Dell, C-O-A-C-H-D-E-L, at gmail.com. That's a simple one. People seem to remember that one. <laughs> uh, you can also contact me by email at Dell, D-E-L, at DellGerard.com. Del Gerard is D-E-L, first name, last name G-E-R-A-R-D. Now, if you want yeah. the phone number, I can give you the phone number, but sometimes yeah, people don't want that phone number. Give you a phone number. I'll tell you like my mom says, 714-244-6382. That's two four four six three eight two. Is she from Alabama or something? She's from Louisiana. Louisiana. Shreveport. Yeah, uh, Lafayette. Lafayette. Huh? Yeah, I was actually Lafayette. born there. So she's uh, we're French Creole. So I tell people we're not black. We're French is, Creole. Is that far from? <laughs> is that far from Baton Rouge? Not too far. Not too far. I haven't but, been to Louisiana yet. That seemed like a good place to oh, go. Oh, it's is nice. There a lot to do there. Good food. Uh, I haven't been there in years, but uh, it was it was fun, you know, when I was younger. I've been to New Orleans. <laughs> okay, yeah, New Orleans. You got to say that with one syllable. Adrian, yeah. how do we get a hold of you? Well, it's Adrian A D R I E N N E at thecaregiverspace dot org, uh, and the website is thecaregiverspace dot org. And there you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever. We're all over the place. <laughs> Great. And with me, it's simple. I'm a caregiver. I'm Dave. It's caregiverdave.com, and everything is there. The membership website, the, the videos, the show, the radio, you name it, you got it. So we'll see you next week, same time, Facebook Live. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program with Dave Nassani.